everyone. I'm Liz Brown Swanson, and you are watching RPV City Talk, our special public safety edition with Lomita Sheriff Station Captain James Power. Always terrific to have you here. You give us great information to keep us all safe. How are you, for starters? I'm doing very well, thank you, and thanks for having me. Okay. Well, we bring you in every quarter because you meet with the Regional Law Contract Committee and our local elected leaders to discuss just the quarterly statistics on crime, what we're, how we're doing with public safety. You just met in February. How about the takeaways with the crime stats and how we're doing in terms of keeping our community safe right now? Well, the crime stats, uh, unfortunately, they're a little bit, we ended the year with a little bit of an uptick. Uh, quarterly, they didn't appear as, as devastating as, they, as I had watched throughout the year. And I know that was just a quarterly update, but uh, like I said, I, it's the end of the year, so I look at the end of the year numbers. And, and the, the same things, the, the larceny thefts, uh, burglaries, uh, both vehicle, residential, and commercial, and Grand Theft Autos were the, the biggest concerns I had, and they always have been and they always will be. Okay. And I know we've, but how we've kicked off the new year so far. We're, we're doing well. We're doing better than last year. Our numbers are, uh, they're down, but they can, they can always be better. So we're not perfect, but we're getting there. What can you share about the trends you're seeing in Rancho Palos Verde specifically and on the peninsula with what's happening with crime? The trends I'm seeing, uh, most recently I'm seeing some residential burglaries that are a, a concern of mine. However, those numbers aren't glaring, uh, but there's some things that we're paying attention to. And um, the, the larceny thefts that we had um, a high number of last year, they, they've act, those have actually dropped, which is a good thing. And then the Grand Theft Autos, uh, they're, they're lower, but they're still a concern, if right. that makes sense to you. Yeah. Uh, they're always a concern. But I, I'm not, I mean, as far as a trend, I'm not seeing a, a trend per se, but I am seeing things that are occurring. And uh, it's, it's, we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, I'm making efforts to focus on it, um, visibility and some suppression operations. Right. So there's not like hot spots. I know some people wonder, is there some place in the peninsula that may feel safer right now than others? I know there's mapping systems that you have and you've sort of changed how you map. So what can you shed light on about that in terms of maybe a particular spot in RPV to watch out? So the mapping systems are, uh, it's, it's a computerized version of the old fashioned pin map. Okay. And yeah, we did change. It's just we didn't change the the system. We just changed the format in which we view it and, and manage it. Um, and that's that's actually working out very well. As far as any hotspots, you don't. There's nothing's been identified through any any uh, crime mapping. However, there's always my concern. Any parking lots that you go to, uh, like where you want to hike, or a park somewhere where you're going to be out of your car for uh, multiple hours, that's always a concern. And that is typically a target because that's where the bad guys are going to focus on because they know you're going to be out of that car for several hours. So those would be uh, areas that I would be of concern. Right. Now we've kicked the new year off. Last year we loved to tell our community and remind everyone how safe we really are here on the Hill. Ranch Palos Verdes was ranked the fourth safest city during 2021. How are we going to, how are we going to you know, keep that going in 2022? What, what do we need to do as a community? Um, how can we work together just to keep working on that of becoming safer? So I have two words, <laughs> vigilance and communication. And so it, we, we have to stay vigilant and we have to keep our eyes open and we, we have to call law enforcement when we see something and report it. That, that's very, very helpful. And then the communication part of it is if you're going to be out of town, let your neighbors know. Have your neighbors collect your mail. Uh, maybe timers for your lights. There's, there's little things that you can do to help uh, make people think you're home. And anything we can do to prevent crime is, is a plus. Right. And we want to reduce any opportunities uh, that may exist. And when you see something, you don't report it on next door. You call, let me the sheriff's department. Is that right? Well, yes. you can still call next door, but Pete, you need to be notified when things are going on. Yes, and thanks for bringing that up. And, and what's important is that you can post it on next door, but before you do that, call the sheriff's station or your local law enforcement agency, wherever it may mm -hmm. be, and report it. It's more, it's, it, uh, there's nothing that uh, I find it, it strikes a nerve with me when I read something on a social media post and it was never reported to law enforcement. Right. And, and that, that's, it, it's just not effective. It's very ineffective. Yeah. Let's talk about, talk about how effective your team is in making arrests. 
Um, what can you tell us about just the latest information and the, and the success stories, how you are able to uh, make arrests and the crime solved and, you know, also to point to the success that you're having thanks to the technology out there like ALPR cameras. Um, I know, for example, you mentioned during a recent mayor's breakfast how uh, the number of grand auto thefts was up, but at the same time, you had the same matching number of arrests. Not the same cases, but how that all comes together and how you're, you're solving crime as we go. So there's technology that the city has invested in, and it has to do with, with ALP or systems. And those are very, very effective because it allows us to uh, catch criminals when they're up here capering. Um, and they're looking, a lot of times they're looking to, to steal or to, to steal a car, to break into a home, whatever it may be. So the success stories, uh, they're, they're ongoing. And it's, it's very, very effective. Um, there's another one that I'll, I'll share with you is uh, there was a, a resident that was very uh, vigilant, paying attention, mm -hmm. and he observed some individuals that didn't fit in, in the neighborhood, so to speak. He knew they weren't, they, weren't they weren't the neighbors. And so he called us and come to find out they were actually, they had just broken into the house of one of his neighbor's homes, homes. And we were able to coordinate a response and, and apprehend them. And we solved that burglary and several other burglaries. Um, in our area and outside our area. And, and that's where the see something, say something really pays off. Mm -hmm. Your deputies are always focused on obviously keeping our community safe and dealing with traffic safety and enforcement. That's a big part of what's going on. Um, what do the traffic stats look like, the latest that you shared, and um, just sort of the concerns that we saw residents are raising recently that live in the near the intersection of on Hawthorne Boulevard and Vallon? concern about what's going on there with safety. So can you kind of talk about that? So traffic safety is always a concern of the public and it always has been throughout my entire career. So what I can tell you in the last year, um, our, motor, our, our motorcycle deputy retired. Uh, he was off since last March. And so we suspended that item. And because of that, the productivity that he produced was extremely high. And as, as any, any effective motor officer, they're going to produce a lot of citation uh, mm -hmm. statistics. So our, our statistics had dropped. Our traffic enforcement um, hazardous citations were much lower. And I believe it was because of his, his absence. And, and so that doesn't mean our other deputies aren't out there doing that because we do uh, enforce traffic laws. However, the, the numbers are lower because of, of his absence. And so we have a new motor officer that's in, in motor school as we speak and he should be completing that school ho hopefully very soon and then he's got to go through some training and then we'll have him out here uh, enforcing laws. In regards to Hawthorne and Vallon, um, yeah there was some concern at the last council meeting and uh, one of the concerns was the number of actual traffic collisions was lower than what the numbers depicted and that is due to a lot of people just don't report it. And so if there's a minor fender bender that people are in and nobody's hurt and it's just very, very minor, sometimes people will elect not to call law enforcement and just to handle it through their insurance company or handle it on their own. And that's perfectly okay. And the California Vehicle Code allows that. And so if the damage is, if it exceeds a certain amount of money, then it needs to be reported. And if it's below that, then it doesn't. And, and so with that, uh, I'm not going to discount their concerns because they, they are, they, it's, it's a, Hawthorne Boulevard is, is there's a grade there. There's 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 a, a percentage of grade there, and any intersection is always a concern. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, uh, I actually did it while I was listening to it at the council meeting. I texted my traffic guys from my phone in the meeting, and asked them to start focusing some efforts on visibility and enforcement in in and around that area. And that's been taking place. Right. I know residents contacted they, you know the city council meeting. This is when it first came up. So it's, you're on it. The council's on it. Um, obviously making sure that we're safe as we're coming up and down Hawthorne Boulevard. Um, I want to move on to talk a little bit about what makes the Lameda Sheriff Station unique, and then we're going to move on to talk about your goals for the new year. But I think we're, you know, we're coming through this pandemic. It's impacted staffing, your resources, everything at the station. So can you just talk about how the, what makes your operation unique and how you've faced all these challenges together and, and all that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> then we'll talk you know, about your goals for the new year. Being unique, um, I, 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 we have, there's, there's four cities right. that, that we contract with. Uh, three on the Hill, Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills Estates, and Rancho Palos Verdes, and the city of La Media. And then I have uh, some unincorporated areas uh, in and about on the peninsula and off the peninsula down in San Pedro as well. And so that, that is unique, having the county areas spread out like that. But 
it's, I don't look at it as, I, I look at it as kind of an advantage because we're up here, we're nearby, uh, and we, all, the, all the cars help one another out. And, and that's why we have these regional law meetings. It's the regional policing concept of it. So the cities, they share, there's a partnership between the cities as well, and there's a great relationship. And it's the same way in law enforcement. Uh, and so, I, I mean, it's, it's really, it's other stations throughout the, the Sheriff's Department County, uh, they, they have similar situations as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not anything new to me. Uh, I, and, and so as, as far as that's concerned, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, well, but. I, I mean, I, you could just say just patrolling this area, I think with the, just the, ge the geography is makes it different. There's a lot of nooks I, and crannies and it takes longer to get from point A to point B. I mean, everybody wants good response times and things like that. So those, I guess those would come under challenges. Yes. That makes it. And, yeah. And, and yeah, you bring up a good point that there is a challenge because of the, of the, the geography and the topography. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got uh, streets that, that they dead in, they don't go all the way through. And I have heard in, in conversations with some of my deputies that are new here, uh, especially specifically new, uh, supervisors that I have that are new here, and, and they, they've actually commented about that. I mm -hmm. yeah, I thought the street would go through. And, and so that can, it can actually impact your response time, especially if you're responding to an emergency call and you're you're taking a path that's that leads into a dead end. So that that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And then going from point A to point B could be from one side of the peninsula to another. And there's only a few methods to get to right. that point A to point B. And so yet that can be a challenge. But the the knowledge of the deputy, and I said this a few years ago. I had a I had a uh, I when I first got here, I had 15 brand new deputies. Well, that was three years ago, almost three years ago, and so now, now they're not brand new. And so the education and experience that they have uh, is a benefit. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but you're right, it, it can be challenging because of the, the way the geography sits here. And how about the challenges with staffing? I know everybody sh was short-staffed, and you're dealing with overtime issues. How is that all coming together for your team? It's been manageable up to this point and we're getting to a point where I've actually implemented some things just as of last week mm -hmm. um, as, as far as uh, mandatory overtime for, for the deputies to yeah. all step up and, and require them to work some overtime uh, because I my staffing levels on paper look really really good but I've got people that are off for a variety of different reasons and so it shows on paper that I have a deputy sheriff there but if they're not working well uh, I really don't. And mm -hmm. so that's where my staffing uh, concerns have, have risen up a little bit. And that's across the county. And, you know, without getting into anything political, it's, we're managing it. And I think that, uh, I think we're better off than a lot of my, my other stations that, that are managing their situations. Right. Um, you are a great communicator. You focus on that and having your deputies go into neighborhoods they've never been in perhaps, just make themselves known and uh, about community policing. Um, and you go to every meeting you can. You're at city council meetings. You were recently at the at the mayor's breakfast and you share what you can. Um, and um, so you were talking about a new program, a pilot program that's being started right now um, that involves body cameras and all focused on um, when dealing with deputies come in contact with people living with mental um, health conditions and, and to make that a safer situation. Can you go about, tell us about this pilot program? Absolutely. So what we've learned is in the past, dealing with um, mentally ill um, situations, that, that deal, well, responding to calls for service, dealing with anyone that may or may not have a, a mental illness is always a concern. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen through statistics is that um, uses of force and deputy involved shootings um, are, I'm not going to say they're rising, but with that what we're seeing is a lot of the people that we're using force on or, or being involved in the shooting with has some sort of mental illness. And so because of that, uh, what we've done is we've launched this pilot program with our body cameras that we can actually go live. And uh, if just a backup, whenever we respond to a call for service and we know that we're dealing with somebody that has a mental illness, there's protocol that, that, we, um, that we manage. And one of those is to immediately contact a mental health team. So we have mental evaluation teams uh, throughout the county. We don't have one at every station. And so 
what we have to do is we have to request that. So our dispatch, when they get that call for service, one of the things, the first things they're gonna do is they're gonna reach out to a mental team, a mental health team, to see uh, if they're available to respond. And sometimes that takes time, depending on where they're at and what their availability is. So what we have now with this pilot program is we can, what we call, go live on our body cameras. Right. So they can- They're not wearing yours today. Usually you have them. Well, I, I, yeah. I've got the tie on, so uh, yeah, they don't, yeah. they don't blend well together. Yeah. But we can, uh, we can get a hold of that, that mental team that's responding or somebody that's in an office um, w with the mental health team. They can review and watch our live footage from our body cameras. And um, it, it just got launched last week, so I don't have any right. success stories to share with you, but that's where we're at. And it's a tool to help um, basically manage the situation and minimize any type of uh, force use or de-escalate the situation uh, for a successful outcome without anyone getting hurt. Right. Um, I know when you, you brought up this pilot program, you talked about what it's like to be in law enforcement today and the challenges versus when you started decades ago and to, to now know that you're needing tools like this. Um, what can you share about your personal goals as captain um, of the station as we go forward in the new year? This is your first time in here in 2022, so just wondering if you have any new goals for the year and um, what well, you're focusing on. My, my goals a lot of times don't change. And um, of course, crime reduction, you know, our, our contribution to public safety, our contribution to the quality of life and the communities that we serve are always a top priority. But the safety uh, and, and the longevity of the safety of my, of my staff is also a goal. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, this job is dangerous and there's risk involved. And, you know, we, we look at what happened just recently with LA County Fire Department and they suffered a tragic loss and it hit home because it was in our home here. Mm -hmm. um, and that was tough, that was very tough and I, I don't wish that upon anyone. And so anything that I can do or I can encourage my managers or my supervisors or and my staff to do to improve that and to better that is always a goal. Um, like I said, I don't want to discount it. It's, it's, it there's, there's two sides of this. There's our health and our well-being and then there's the health and well-being of the communities that we serve as well, which is in that quality of life. And uh, so those are always my goals. Mm -hmm. um, the, the crime stats, I, I, there's only so much I can do. There's only so, much, only so much we can do, but the communication and the partnership between all of us is, is what's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And you feel like you have the resources you need to do what you need to do. I mean, I know every city council you go to, in the past, RPV, for example, added an extra patrol car for this city. Um, and just, um, I, I mean, you can, I guess there's never enough probably in the end. The, no, correct. I mean, it, I, I would always, I will never turn it down, yeah. but I get it. I mean, it's expensive. It, it's, it's, it impacts the budget. The city has yeah. a budget to manage and I believe uh, it's a $7 million contract, it, it, right? Maybe. And even right now with the staffing issues with the sheriff's department, the, all of that, even if the city wanted to, to put more right now, mm -hmm. that's all on hold right now, pending the outcome of the, of these staffing issues. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, goals, we, we always manage to get by, uh, and uh, everybody has a breaking point. I don't think we're there yet. We're, we're I mean, I, the morale is high, um, and I, I've addressed that just recently with some of the stuff that's going on in society, and I, I meet with my staff regularly, and I want to know how they're doing, mm -hmm. and, and I'm very genuine about that. So we communicate very, very well. And you're always communicating with residents. You try to uh, bring the community in. You had a an event, your second Cadillac converter etching event in La Mita. Um, those, these, this is important to get people involved in doing their part to try to prevent a crime. So tell us about how that event just went recently. You had that. So yeah, we had uh, a Cadillac converter etching event and um, it, that, that always goes off really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we open it up to everybody uh, in the area. We don't turn, we basically don't turn anyone away. Um, you know, we, we kind of market it towards our jurisdictional boundaries, but, but yet people from the outside, if they show up, so be it. So we, uh, um, the, we had the, you know, the tow truck service that, that mm -hmm. comes in and, the, and they'll do the actual etching, but we had, um, our, our trap team right. from the, the county sheriff's department. So Which they were a part as well. Task force for regional auto theft prevention. Trap. It's the, right, right. Correct. So, and, and that's a, a federally funded auto theft task force that's been in existence for a long, long time. So I, that, that was created back in the days in the early 90s when I was a deputy. Um, very, very effective program. And they were there. They were at this event. 
and they had uh, examples of devices that you can use to protect your catalytic converter from being stolen. Okay. Um, the, the Toyota Prius is one of the most common cars that gets, that gets hit, and they actually have a, like a steel plate that you can actually install. I don't remember the cost, but there is a cost associated with it, but it's far less than the cost mm -hmm. of replacing that catalytic converter. And then they had some cable locks or the, the devices that were um, on display as well that, that go around the catalytic converter that protects it in such a way, uh, not from being stolen, but it would basically take them a lot longer to steal it. Mm -hmm. And then they also did some other some some other etching uh, in the in their um, on the automobile to assist law enforcement in identifying if um, if those parts ended up on another car. How many cars like, showed up for that? Or, was it a couple hundred or? I want to say out? it was close to two hundred. Yeah. I don't know. Have the I don't have the exact number. Uh, yeah. So it was, but it was a successful event. Always successful. Um, any other crime prevention tips that, I mean, you could list that you want our residents watching right now to think about um, how to protect themselves and their property? Absolutely. Um, lock your valuables up. Lock your cars. Lock your doors and windows. Don't leave valuables in plain sight. Um, and if you're going to leave on vacation, tell a neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, buy some. You can buy timers for your lights inside your house and have your lights come on and off. It throughout the, you know, different times of the day to make it appear that you're home. Uh, there's all kinds of things that um, what we, uh, I, I call it reducing criminal opportunity. And it's a component of, of crime prevention through environmental design, which is something I teach. And it's anything that you can do to prevent that from happening, uh, the better off you'll be. And what we find is um, some of the residential burglaries that we experienced year to date so far were people that are out of town. And so, uh, how did the how did the burglars know they were out of town? Um, and understand that crooks they watch, you know they 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 do their homework as well before they hit a location. And one thing I always ask myself whenever I see a a, a recent residential burglary is I will look at the homes on the street and ask myself why they picked that house. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they pick the house to the left or the house to the right uh, or the house up the street? Uh, and that's always a concern of mine. And so. Uh, there's a reason they picked that house and trying to identify those reasons sometimes it's re really really easy I mean if you've got a dozen newspapers on the driveway and your mailbox right. is, is overflowing with mail um, then there's a pretty good indication you haven't been home for a few days and that's where communicate with your neighbor if I leave on vacation I have my neighbor I let my neighbors know and they collect my mail for me uh, they'll pick up my newspapers and and they'll go in and out of my house uh, and bring it in for me and and so that gives the appearance that somebody's home. I'll even let them park, park a car in my driveway. Um, just f whatever whatever it takes. When it comes to crime prevention, we always are constantly being reminded, you know, let's join Neighborhood Watch, get involved in that saying, if you see something, say something. Um, and I think some people still are just, they don't want to get involved. But can you just give us some examples of when people have stepped up and have reported something suspicious activity and it's actually resulted in arrest or prevented a crime just right here in our own city in our PV when this actually has worked when people have reported something so absolutely there's two that come to mind one's in, one's in our PV and that's the the resident that saw people breaking into his neighbor's house right. and he reported it and we were able to respond quick enough and to get there and catch him in, not in the act but immediately after the fact but we solved multiple burglars for that and then just um, during the holidays when we had um, a lot of uh, smash and grab thefts that were going on throughout Southern California and, and the grab and goes type thing, we had a few of those. And one of my sergeants at the station uh, went and did a surveillance on his own in a parking lot uh, in the Peninsula Center. And a, a resident, or not a resident, but a customer came out of one of the stores and said, hey, I think there's some people in, in the store stealing. So he did some follow up and sure enough, uh, they were in fact doing that. We arrested them out in the parking lot, and we learned that there was just a carload of stolen merchandise from a whole bunch of different stores. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times people think, well, I don't want to waste your time. you got more important things to do. Uh, but that's what our job is, and I'm asking you to call us. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, 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 I can't emphasize that enough. It's, it's so important. We only have a few minutes left, and we appreciate all the information you're sharing. But any final captain's announcements that you want to address the community? Anything else you want to share that you think is really important? Well, I can I can tell that uh, there's two deputy sheriffs that were part of this community 
for a lot of years, and that's uh, Deputy Resosa and Deputy Tammy Baus, and they were on our core team, our community resource team, and they just recently retired. And so uh, we've got some replacements lined up, and I'm going to let Sergeant McCoy, who's the, the supervisor of that team, make that announcement to the cities when, it's, when she feels it's, uh, it's appropriate, which mm -hmm. will be very, very soon. But those shoes are going to be very, very tough to fill. They, they leave with a lot of knowledge uh, and expertise that's personalized to this jurisdictional area. And, and so filling those shoes are going to be very, very challenging for us, but we're going to do our best. Yes. And so I'll leave it with that. And we're going like to miss said, those deputies, Tammy yeah. and um, Reese. And on one quick note, I don't know if you knew this, but I have to admit years ago when my house was broken into in Seaview at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with numerous homes in my neighborhood, it was Deputy Bouse that showed up, and my 12-year-old, she was so amazing, who was very shaken up about it. Um, she was just, she had the gift of just handling it so well and, and took a lot of the, the you know, what, what we were dealing with, the trauma of it all out mm -hmm. of it, and she was so professional, and I can't thank her enough. And Just to add on your uh, victimization, if you ask any, uh, I've interviewed burglary victims throughout my career, and every one of them, when I interview that, I ask them how they felt at that time, and they said they felt violated. Mm -hmm. And I take that personal. Uh, I'm very, very passionate about that. So whatever we can do to minimize that, I will. And they did. Well, thank you. You're doing a good job. Thanks for your service, and we'll have you back here in a few more months, and hopefully you're reporting that things are looking good and trends are crimes going down, and thanks for keeping us safe. All right, with that, thank you so much, Captain Powers, for joining us here on RPV City Talk. We'll have you back uh, for your next quarterly report. Until then... Everyone that's watching, thank you for joining us. Stay safe out there. Have a great day, everybody.